Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Marty. I'm alcoholic. I'm fortunate to be sober today. Great day to be sober. Uh, I want to thank the group for inviting myself and my wife uh, here. It's an honor to do anything for Alcoholics Anonymous. But we were really, uh, when I got the phone call that uh, I could come speak out here, we were really looking forward to coming here. Um, Seattle is one of our favorite spots, and uh, you know, it's just it's a, it's a privilege. And I want to thank Mark for picking us up and uh, the group as a whole. Um, it's uh, a great meeting here. Um, the last time we were here, we really enjoyed ourselves. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself and, um, and, uh, my story is just what it is. And I really, it's changed in the last couple of years and uh, a lot of great things has, has happened since I, I was last year. Um, but I'll start from the beginning. I am, uh, I'm one of five children. I was born in New Jersey. Uh, my mother raised the five of us. And uh, my father lived about 20 miles away from us, and uh, I didn't see him that often. Uh, I, I, the story has changed over the years. Uh, I had this big resentment toward my dad, so I made the story bigger and better, so that, you know, like I waited for him in the snow, and, you know, I... I <laughs> I found out that that wasn't so true, and then, uh, you know, like, he never showed up. Well, he hardly showed up, which is different than never. So, um, you know, as time goes, more is revealed. And uh, my father was my father. My father was an alcoholic and a compulsive gambler. And when you're young, you don't understand those things. Uh, all I knew is that uh, I played sports all through school and grammar school, and he, was, he wasn't around. But yet my mother was there every, every time. So, uh, you know, I said this last time and I'll say it again. Um, there was a guy in a meeting when he said this. And I think what happens for me in Alcoholics Anonymous is, uh, especially early on, I, when I got sober, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous wowed me, um, pretty quickly. And, uh, every once in a while, not every day, not in every meeting, you hear something and you say, yeah, I understand that, or I agree with that. And uh, I, I was early in sobriety, and this guy said, I didn't have the worst childhood, I didn't have the best childhood, I had the longest childhood. And uh, I kind of understood that, you know. Uh, it never seemed to have grown up. Um, again, I'm one of five children. I'm the only one who goes to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I can tell you this from here. Um, before I ever picked up a drink, I had problems. And um, the biggest problem I had started when I was very, very young, and uh, I had an inability to tell the truth. And uh, every time I'm in a meeting and somebody brings up the topic honesty, I can hear in the background, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And, uh, and I struggled. You know, I am... I've said this to my wife. I'm here with my wife. I met my wife. Um, I was eight months sober. She was four months sober. And everybody told us to stay away from each other. And uh, they were right, but we did it anyway. And uh, 14 years later, we're married, and we have a wonderful life together in sobriety. Um, boy meets girl on AA campus. So, um, you know, I was uh, seven or eight years old, and um, I started stealing. And I remember the first thing I ever stole. Uh, I was coming home from school, and um, I was walking home from school, and John Ryan owned the Gulf gas station on the corner, and I needed to use the bathroom. And when he said, yeah, it's inside, go inside. So I walked inside, and as I walked past his desk, there was a little Dixie cup with dimes in it. And... I looked outside, and he was pumping gas, and I took a dime out of the thing, and every day I had to use the bathroom after that, <laughs> you know, and uh, I used to buy baseball cards with them. You would get 10 cards and a stick of gum for six cents, and um, 
we used to throw cards in the park and uh you know I had a great childhood but I had the reason I bring that up is I had defects before alcohol and um stealing stayed with me my whole life and caused a lot of damage to my family and uh a lot of wreckage to repair and uh when I was 11 years old um my mother brought me to uh a clinic a mental health clinic to speak with a counselor and uh years later I asked my mother uh why she took me to this counselor I said mom I was 11 years old what how bad could it have been and she said you were just always lying and I said well I was 11 ma and she said no it was the way you lie in such detail <laughs> she says you you talk about people that aren't there you know in places that aren't there with stuff that's not there and it's it's almost like a motion picture for you and uh she said and that was really scary um you think you're going through a stage but your stage was not going away so uh I grew up with my brothers and my sister and uh my um uh, we lived in my grandmother and grandfather's house. My grandfather died when I was very young. Um It's funny the things that your mind remembers and uh I boy I haven't told this story in forever and uh My grandfather died when I was 5 years old. And uh I can remember sitting in my grandfather's truck in his fruit and vegetable truck and uh we would drive back from new york and he would unload the produce and he'd bring me in the back where we they would make fruit baskets and he'd put a whole bunch of fruit around me and he'd say go ahead go make some fruit baskets and i also remember going upstairs he lived upstairs and i went upstairs and i remember what he was wearing and he uh he looked at me and he tapped his next to the chair for me to come over by him And he had this little transistor radio in his ear and uh he I I sat next to him and he took the transistor out of his ear and he said Mickey Mantle's up and uh I mean how do you remember when you're 5 years old and I can tell you I can stand here right now and my father who died when I was 18 I I I can tell you I remember two or three things that he said to me in my whole life but my grandfather because of the type of man he was i remember him and uh so as i was growing up i i played sports and uh i had a great time um my friend Pete from Minnesota uh who's a really good friend of mine he uh when i first got sober he said to me uh do you remember the last time you were really free like you you had nothing holding you back like How old were you? What were you doing? And I had to think about it for a while and I was playing wiffle ball with Rocco Puzo. And uh I was like 13 or 14 years old. The Yankees were winning. Uh Rocco knew how to uh look like everybody who was batting, Thurman Munson and Reggie Jackson and and we just uh we played two on two at Westervelt Park and uh If you hit it over the scoreboard it was a homer and you know it, there was no running or anything like that but it was it was a blast and then uh I stole money from Rocco Puzo and uh I think I was like 14 I stole it out of his locker and uh things changed all the people around me cuz they knew how close me and Rocco were and I didn't understand this at that time I didn't understand that my character there was there were flaws in my makeup that i had these defects of character and i really i hadn't I had no male role models um but my brothers and my sister they they didn't have those issues uh, first time i ever picked up a drink i was 16 years old i was on the train tracks with my brother's friends and uh, they were drinking white cream concord wine and they're passing it around and um I wanted to fit in and uh the only thing that I remember and I I do this to the, today I drink too fast and too much 
And if it's iced tea, I drink too much iced tea. If I drink water, I drink it too fast. If it's soda, I drink three quarters of the can on the first sip. And, uh, and that's how I drank. I drank too much and too fast. And I got sick that day, and I remember, uh, you know, I hear people say that they, uh, they got this big, ah, from the drink. And I understand that people get that. And I don't know if I got that. Um, I know that I got drunk that night, that day, and I ran home and I tried to sneak in my house because I didn't want to disappoint my mother. And, uh, I threw up. And I remember as I was throwing up saying, I'm never going to do this again. Never, ever. I was a quitter from the first time. <laughs> and then about a week later, they were drinking wild turkey on the train tracks. And I said, well, maybe that's different. I'll try a little of that. <laughs> and uh, I drank wild turkey too fast and too much of it, and I got sick. And uh, I started working at a restaurant, uh, an Italian restaurant. And uh, there was a guy who owned the restaurant. And uh, he was like my father. Um, I looked at him like he was my father. And uh, Frank um, said something to me one day when I was working. I was like 16, and I'm bussing tables, and somebody dropped something, and I ran over there to help him clean it up. And he looked at me, and he said, you have potential. And I remember how that made me feel, that somebody thought maybe Marty had potential. And uh, I was going to bring some stuff here that my mother saved when I was a child, my um, report cards. And uh, the back of my report card said stuff like, uh, Marty needs more self-control. Uh, Marty doesn't live up to his potential. This thing started when I was really, really young, before the drink ever happened. I didn't even know when I'm 16, 17 years old, I have no idea I'm alcoholic. I, I believe I drink too fast and too much. I should have stopped. First time I'm working for Frank, I buy a car. My first car is a 1973 Pinto. It was, um, I paid $150 for it. It was red, hand painted. Uh, it was, it was a nice car, and uh, I'm working, and I got a few dollars in my pocket, and I'm working in this uh, northern New Jersey mob restaurant, and everybody buying everybody a drink, give him a drink, give him a drink, give him a drink, give everybody a drink, and they're all pulling money out, and big stacks of money. There's no debit cards, very few credit cards. They got rubber bands around their money, and I'm like, that's really cool. So I start going out to, I went to this club, it was called Elegante, it was up in Fairview, New Jersey, first club I ever go to, and uh, somebody had told me about it, I drive the Pinto up there, find a spot, I wait in line, and it's $15 to get in, and I'm like, $15, they said the Manhattans are playing tonight, and I'm like, okay, Manhattans, $15, I'll take a shot. So I wait in line, I go in, and I'm drinking vodka and tonics back then with a lime in it. And uh, they're like $3 a drink back then, $3, $4. And I'm drinking them as fast as, like I'm drinking water. I'm putting it down, give everybody a drink, give them a drink, give me another, I'm drinking, 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 drinking. And of course, I drank too fast and too much, and when I'm leaving, I pull over, they were just building the Meadowlands Complex, and I pulled over and I got sick. I remember throwing up and it burned, and I said, I will never put fruit in my drinks again. <laughs> no more limes in my fruit, that's it. Just vodka and tonic, no fruit. And uh, I did that for a long period of time, and then uh, I went up to this club, same club, and uh, I go to use the restroom. And I'm telling you, it's like 1981 maybe. And uh, there's no stall on the, on the bathroom. There's a big urinal and no stall. And I am use the uh, urinal, and then I go to wash my hands. And I look to the, left, to the right, and there's this guy, and he pulls out this little, little, I'm telling you, it's this big, little vial. 
And on that little vial is this little metal spoon. And I'm looking at him, and as I look at him, he goes like this. And when he goes like this, I go like this. <laughs> and then he goes like this, and then I go like that. And I said, what is that? And he said, cocaine. And I said, I remember this. I said, this guy's not getting out of the bathroom without me trying that. <laughs> and I found out that night that if you mix cocaine and alcohol, you can drink as fast and as much as you want. If you mix the two, you could really, really drink. And you don't even want to go home. You know, you go from New Jersey into New York, and there was a place called The Rooftop back then, $14 on the 14th floor. You walk in, you pay $14, you drink as much as you want. $14. <laughs> Loved it. We'd come home 6, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, you're 19 years old. There's not a problem. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to have a 1973 Pinto and be 19 years old and be drinking and getting drunk. Well, the cocaine is what got me. You know, um, I started that old habit of stealing started again because you never have enough money. And uh, I'm working in the restaurant and people are forgetting their credit cards. And back then, you didn't slide the credit card. There was a little book on the bottom like underneath everything, if, the, if it was over $250, you had to look in the book. There was nobody to call, nothing. Now, I love Frank Bucco, and I, the way I remember the story is I didn't start stealing from him. And I think that's the truth. I really do. I think that's the truth. But he came up to me one night, and he said to me, he looked me straight in the eye, and he said to me, Marty... I know what you're doing. And if you don't stop this, I'm going to have to get rid of you. And I said, I'm not doing anything. And he said, we'll see. And about two weeks later, I missed the shift, and he fired me. And from that moment, the day I got fired by Frank Bucco, my life started going downward. I met a guy who worked for the post office, and back then they would mail the credit cards in the mail, and we started grabbing credit cards, and uh, three years later I was in front of a judge with 1,100 counts of credit card fraud, forgery, theft by deception. I was 22 years old, and uh, I'm going to prison. And... Uh, my family comes and helps me, and they're, they come to the jail. I can't get out on bail, and uh, I'm in trouble. And uh, they give me this judge. His name is William Marchesi. And I said, he's Italian-American. I'm Italian-American. He'll probably take it easy on me. So the trial is coming up closer. It's not a really trial. I'm going to cop out to the best deal I can possibly get, which I don't know what I'm doing. I'm 22 years old thinking I know what I'm doing. And uh, I got a public defender. And uh, I remember standing in front of this judge. And all my head kept saying is, he's Italian-American. I'm Italian-American. It'll probably be all right. And the first thing he said is, you're a disgrace to be an Italian-American. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, I'm in trouble here. And uh, you'll hear people in Alcoholics Anonymous say they were in front of the judge and the judge told them to go to Alcoholics Anonymous or go to prison. Every judge I've ever been in front of told me, Marty, you're going to prison, and when you're done with your prison sentence, you can go to AA. <laughs> and... Uh, so I got sentenced the first time. I, I, I did about three years in prison, and I came out, and I was a different guy. Um, I had a prison story now. And uh, the world is going on without me, and uh, my family is supportive. 
and I get out on a program called ISP, Intense Supervision and Parole. I'm going doing community service, I'm getting urine taken two or three times a week, uh, and I'm doing great for 18 months. And uh, I go in front of a panel of judges who are supposed to release me, and who's there? William Marchesi, the Italian-American. So I got to win three of the four judges to get off this thing, and they ask him first, and he says, no. I'm like, oh, I got to go three for three. Well, sure enough, it was, they were going to let me out. I was doing okay with it. Well, six months later, I'm in trouble again. And uh, now I've become one of those guys that can't stay out of, out of trouble. Um, my life starts to be unraveling very, very quickly. My wife, you listen to my wife's story, my wife has this amazing 20-year of really great drinking, having fun. I got like a year and a half. <laughs> you know? My story's terrible. You know? She's going on trips. She's in Hawaii. She's in Aruba getting drunk. I'm in Passaic County Jail waiting to get shipped to prison. And, uh, I don't know. I, uh, I put alcohol and drugs to the side for a lot of years, and uh, and uh, I was a compulsive. I am a compulsive gambler, and I picked up gambling, and uh, I stayed in trouble my whole life due to gambling. And then one night in my early 30s, we had won some money at the Meadowlands racetrack, and one of the guys ordered a limousine to go to Atlantic City, and we were in the back seat of this limousine and the guy handed me a Heineken and one of the guys said Marty doesn't drink why not I took a sip of that Heineken and you ever know that you're not supposed to do something <laughs> you know I knew I shouldn't have done that well we're by the end of the trip, we're doing cocaine. We're, everything's right back to where it was. I, uh, my story um, before getting to Las Vegas is um, I spent 12 and a half years in prison from the time I was 20 to the time I was 40. And uh, the other seven and a half years, I was either on some type of parole or some type of supervision. And uh, in 1992, my daughter was born. Uh, and I had promised myself and everybody around me that that was it. It'll never happen again. I won't drink or get high again. I won't get in trouble anymore. And uh, six weeks after my daughter was born, I was selling her formula to get drugs and alcohol. And uh, I was living in Philadelphia at the time. And uh, I was hiding out from breaking into my uncle's house and stealing the family heirlooms and breaking into a an apartment complex and stealing, you know. My first sponsor told me, he says, you know, uh, a guy who's been in prison as long as you, you would think you might be a tough guy, but I just really think you're a bad thief. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, and he was really, he was right. You know, I was a terrible thief. I mean, it's, it sounds like I, if I told you the stories the way I made them up, you know, with detail, like my mother used to tell me, like, tell the story that way, it sounds better. You know, I remember doing my inventory, and there was this guy, this bookmaker, his name was Dookie Demera. And um, and I I told my sponsor back then, I said, Dookie Demera, I owed him $8,000, and he came to my job, and he said, I don't care if you got to rob your mother, I want my money. And what he really said was, you owe me $800, Marty. Pay me $100 a week and get this thing over with already. <laughs> but the $8,000 and I'm, you're going to break my legs really sounds better, you know, in your inventory. So uh, I get here and uh, I'm, I got out of prison in uh, May of 2001 and I was, uh, had nowhere to go. 
nobody in my family was talking to me. My mother was taking care of my daughter in Las Vegas, and I went to St. Paul's Shelter in Patterson, New Jersey, and uh, I lived underneath the church in uh, a shelter. And uh, I had about five or six months of parole, and uh, my mother said, I'll give you one more chance to be a father to your daughter. We'll fly out to Las Vegas. And uh, just before I was off parole and I knew they weren't going to be, I started again. And uh, one of the first meetings I got sober in this, and when I got sober this time was, I, there was a guy speaking and he said, I suffer from the disease of I do it again. And when he said that, I said, man, that's what I got. I always do it again. You know, I got every reason not to do it again. I got a family that really, really loves me. I got a beautiful daughter. I, I have an ability to do something, but I, I can't stop. And uh, my mother flew in for the holidays, and uh, I went on a runner just before we were about to leave, and she took me back to Las Vegas, and I got off the plane, and my brother came up to me, and he said, what are you doing here? You're going to ruin mom's retirement. Why don't you get the hell out of here? And I knew he was right. Um, I was living in my mother's house, and I started going to AA meetings, and I'm 39 years old, and I, I start going to meetings, and people are, anybody new to the area? I'm Marty. I am moved here from New Jersey. I have four years sober. Just bought a house up in Summerlin. My car is being shipped, and if you need to call me, I don't have a phone right now, but and I'm living in my mother's bed, uh, other bedroom on a twin bed next to my daughter. But I can't tell you that because I'm 39 years old, and there was a guy I sponsored, and he said the magic word, and when he said it, I said, how do you feel? He said, pathetic. And uh, that's exactly how I felt at 39 years old. Pathetic. And uh, I started working at a restaurant, taking a bus to the rest, this restaurant, dropping wings. I was making $9 an hour, and uh, I would take two buses. And uh, my mother was counting the hours that I was working, and uh, the restaurant that I was working in, If uh, when you were leaving, you could have a drink before you leave. And I kept saying, no, I'm not, I'm, I don't drink, I don't drink, I don't drink. And I got my first paycheck, $257, $257. What are you going to do with $257? You're horrible. I'll take a crown royal on the rocks. And my mother, she was home praying that I would bring that $257 home, not because she needed the $257, she just wanted me to be okay. I remember walking down the street to catch the bus, and uh, I was either going to go west to go home, or east to go get drunk and get high. And I said, whatever bus comes first, that's the bus I'm getting on. And the west was home, east was bad. And the west bus came first, and I went on the other side of the street to the east side and waited for the bus because I cannot control alcohol. I wind up, uh, my mother's husband never liked me. He didn't want me in the house in the first place. He's a retired federal agent. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I'm a career criminal and... Uh, I started stealing his coin collection while I was living there. He, he had this coin collection for like 40 years, and I'm stealing, you know, these uh, silver dollars a couple at a time. And um, I find out later on he knew I was stealing them, but uh, he loved my mother so much he didn't want to say anything. He didn't want to hurt my mother. Who does that? Who lets somebody in their house let them steal so that they don't hurt somebody else? Like he doesn't want to hurt my mother. And uh, I come home after this crazy run and uh, I walk in the house and my mother's pounding me on the chest and says, you can't stay here anymore. 
And she's crying and she's shaking. And uh, I did it again. And uh, I got no solution. I've been coming in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous my whole adult life, whether it was in prison or they were, I would go to meetings. And I promise you, if you're early in sobriety, you can come here, you can come to a million meetings, and if you're not ready to hear it, you won't hear it. I never heard sponsorship, read the book. I used to sit there and look at the clock and count the chairs. When's this damn thing going to be over? Can I get another cup of coffee? i got to go outside and smoke. I couldn't hear it. I was too sick. I started walking the streets of Las Vegas, and uh, now the drug habit's crazy. I'm smoking crack cocaine and drinking Cisco wine. I mean, I am filthy dirty. I got, my feet are bleeding from walking in socks that are, they, they're stuck to me. I'm homeless. And uh, I'm sleeping in the back of the flamingo's pool. Uh, I'm walking into uh, buffets backwards to, you know, try to grab some food while they don't, maybe they won't catch me. I'm walking into chicken places when they're about to close and say, don't throw that chicken out. Can I get some? I'm pathetic. And I got no shot. I got no ID. I got no birth certificate. I'm a career criminal. I'm not all of a sudden going to get a job and it's going to be all right, Marty. I'm done. And, uh, I wind up in West Care Detox. And the reason I'm at West Care Detox is because I really had no other place to go. And I was tired. And uh, there's four men that brought a meeting in there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Bob, Sheldon, Craig, and George. And I listened to the first few guys, and I couldn't hear anything. And then George Boyer said something, and uh, bing. I heard him, and uh, he told me after the meeting, he gave me his phone number. He said, Marty, when you're leaving here, call me. I'll come pick you up, and I said, okay, I will, and a couple days later, it was time to go out of West Care Detox. I looked at his number. I put it in my pocket, and I walked out, and I got drunk again, and I wind up in a uh, sober living house, and uh, excuse me. And I was there for about a week, and my mother came, and she took me food shopping. And uh, she bought me about $60 worth of food, milk, eggs, cereal, peanut butter, stuff for me, some bread so that I could eat. And she dropped me off in front of the place, and I walked in, and I said, anybody want to buy this stuff? Twelve dollars. $12. $12. And I was off again. I wind up in an abandoned swimming pool in uh, the east side of town, smoking crack and drinking Cisco wine. And uh, it's the middle of September. And after a week or so in the pool, September 24th, I... Uh, got out of the pool and I started walking. It was about 8 o'clock at night and I'm on one side of town. I start walking all the way to the other side of town and uh, I knock on a church's door and uh, this deacon answers the door. It's about 9 o'clock at night. I was going to ask him for money and instead I asked to use the phone and I called the guy from the sober living house. And Richie tells the story as that he had shut his phone off. He was, he was going to school to be a nurse. And he would shut his phone off at 8 o'clock so that nobody would, so he could study. And he says, Marty, I'm 100% sure I shut my phone off. And it rang. And I asked him, I said, Richie, can I come back to the house? And Richie was from New Jersey. And uh, he said, Marty, if you can get here, you can sleep on the couch. And... Uh, I walked to the corner of D Street in Washington to a bus stop, 
And I'm telling you, I am filthy. And I stink. And the bus pulls up, and I say to the guy, could you give me a ride to Jones? And he said, no. And I said, please. And he said, get in the back. I got in the back of the bus, and uh, he dropped me off on Jones, and I walked to the sober living house. And I've been sober every day since that walk. And uh, if you had told me on September 24th that September 25th you would be sober and you would never drink again, I would have said that's impossible. But what I did was on September 25th, I took that phone number. How I held on to that phone number, I don't know. And I called George. And George came up and he said, Marty, if uh, I'll pick you up. Be outside. And he said, I'm not waiting for you, so be outside. And uh, I waited outside for him and George picked me up and George was delivering oxygen back then and which was really no job at all. But he would hold me hostage. We'd drive all over town, and we'd go to a meeting here and a meeting there, and he would talk to me, and he would, he would say things to me. And the way I look at the story is he tricked me. <laughs> I had no idea what he was doing. If I knew what he was doing, I probably would have stopped him. And he would ask me questions about my life and about my drinking. And I said, George, I can't stop. I can't stop. Once I start, I can't stop. I drink too much. I drink too fast. My life is crazy. He says, you sound so powerless. <laughs> Went right over my head. A few minutes later, he's talking. And he says, well, tell me about your life. I said, what life? I live in a sober living house. I have no ID. I got nothing. No birth certificate. Nobody in my family wants to talk to me. My life sucks. And he says to me, it sounds so unmanageable. A couple days later, we're at a meeting, very similar to this, and there's this guy, Scott Lee. I think he's from, like, Tennessee or something, and George, or, they got me in between them, and uh, George is looking over at Scott. He said, what do you think God is? Scott says, well, I think he's kind and understanding and patient and loving, and Scott looked at George and said, what do you think he is? Well, he's, I think he's kind and forgiving and really, really patient. So George drove me home that night and he handed me a piece of paper and he said, I want you, he wrote on the top, what God is to you. And uh, he said, write what you think God is. And I'm a thief, man. I, I remembered everything they said, so that's what I was going to write. And uh, I grabbed that piece of paper And I wrote, forgiving. And uh, something started. George asked me uh, that week to start praying, get on my knees and pray. Ask God for help, and then go to a meeting. Lived in the sober living house. I'd get up early in the morning. I'd pray, get on my knees and pray, take a shower, leave the house walk down the street, steal the guy's newspaper, and then go wait. I had these bus tokens from Catholic Charity and wait to get on the bus. And I started reading the paper. I always read the sports section first. I need a job like I need oxygen, but I'm reading the sports section first, okay? <laughs> so I take, the, I take the token, put it in the bus. I go to a meeting. I'm sitting at this meeting, 8 o'clock meeting. Everything's going. Next day, I get up. I'm praying. I get out of the house, take a shower, grab the guy's newspaper, you know, put the token in, go to the meeting. And I'm sitting there after about two weeks. And I said to somebody in the meeting, uh, before the meeting, I said, I've been stealing this guy's paper for like two weeks. He's got to come to an end soon. You know, and the guy said, why, why are you stealing this paper? I said, I'm looking for a job. And the guy said, it's hard to find a job with a stolen classified. And I went, I never looked at it that way. That was like one of those big wow moments. Like, 
You might want to stop stealing, Marty. (laughs) So the next day I prayed, I asked God for help, and I walked out. And I went to go steal the paper, and it was like it was on fire. Don't steal it, Marty. And I left it. And uh, I went to the club that day, and there were a few guys there, and they, um, they were going to this job fair. And I was like, they said, you want to come? I said, yeah, I'll come. So I was at the Meadows Mall, and there are all these long tables, and there are people, you know, with applications and stuff like that. And I'm, I get like two shoes that they're lucky they match. You know, one pant leg is longer than the other. I'm looking for a job with bad clothes and, you know, I'm a mess. No ID, nothing. So I go up to fill out an application. They say, can I see your ID? I said, I don't have one. Well, you can't fill out an application. Now the noise starts in my head. It's never going to happen for you, Marty. You're too far gone. You're an idiot. You're so stupid. What do you think you're, what are you doing here? And all of a sudden, I looked up, and I saw Macy's. I said, I don't know why I thought this. I said, maybe they'll hire me for the holidays. I walked in there, walked up the steps, walked into this little room, and I said to the young girl behind the counter, I said, can I get an application? And she said, we don't do applications. It's in the computer room. And I said, God, I don't even know how to turn a computer on. And the noise just gets louder and louder of what a horrible person I am, what I've done to my mother, what I've done to my family, how I haven't shown up for my daughter. And uh, for whatever reason, I look in the room, and one of the computers is on. So I try it. I walk in, I start typing my name, and it gets to a point where it says, References. So I figured, okay, I'll put ex-NFL football players. <laughs> so I put Jan Stenerud, Steve Barkowski, Ray Guy. I'm just throwing, I got, I got no references. And I figure I'm early enough in sobriety, I can lie. I'm trying to get a job. Please, give me a break. And... Uh, I know I'm not getting a job. And Two weeks later, I'm at the sober living house, and the phone rings, and it's a woman named Patricia Light. And she said, uh, come in, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to have another interview. And I went in, and she said to me, "Uh, what do you want to do? And I said, sell shoes. And she said, have you ever sold shoes before? And in my head, I said, I've sold mine, that counts. So, yeah. So, uh, the interview goes pretty good. I've always been a good talker. I'm a, you know, I live a double life. I can, even when things are bad, I can make them look like they're all right. And uh, I'm talking to her. And a week later, phone call, second interview. I'm like, what? Now my mom gets me some clothes and, I'm 40 years old. My mom's buying me clothes. My mother's buying my underwear and socks. I'm 40 years old. I go to this interview, and there's all these 17-year-old kids in there. I'm 40 years old. And they go, they're all around this big table, and they say, we're going to go around the room. Tell me where you're from, why you want to work at Macy's, and use the word outstanding because that's Macy's word. I'm like, you got to be kidding. So this young kid, I'm Jeff, and, you know, my family loves Macy's. We've been coming to Macy's. My my great-grandmother used to come to Macy's. Macy's is outstanding. (laughs) Fuck. This girl goes, and she says, I have a Macy's credit card. And that my first thought was, I'm 40 years old. I've never had a credit card that was mine. They get to me and they say, I say, I'm Marty, I'm a, and I almost said I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) 
And I said, uh, I said to them, if uh, you give me a chance, I promise I'll show up. I really need this job. And they hired me. And God's funny, because they were just opening the fashion show mall, and they needed a bunch of people. And they really, when you need a bunch of people, they don't do thorough background checks. (laughs) So they don't know who they have. And the first day I'm working, they have me at a table, like about twice the size as that one, and I'm taking people's credit card information. (laughs) And I remember in the back of my head saying, don't do anything stupid, Marty. Just pass them along. People would give them to me. Did I do it right? I'd say, yeah, you did it fine. Perfect. Next. I was afraid to even look at them. And uh, I started selling shoes. And uh, I was working there about a week, week and a half. And I had this overwhelming feeling of somebody's watching me. And uh, I'm waiting for somebody to go, we need to talk. Like they found out. And uh, I'm so scared that I go up to human resources I knock on the door and she, I go to walk in. I say, I need to tell you something. She said, just sell shoes. I said, yeah, but I have to tell you. No, you don't have to tell me anything. Just go sell shoes. We know. I said, you know, go sell shoes. (laughs) Uh, I was selling shoes like a bandit. My wife bought a lot of shoes that she never wore. <laughs> and she's, she was getting me right from the very beginning. Um, I don't know, it's eight months sober. I walked out of a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and there was a woman standing out in front. And I stopped and talked to her. And uh, she was struggling that day. And uh, huh. who knew? that I just met the love of my life. The absolute, I, I promise you, I would not be standing here today if it wasn't for my wife. I would have screwed this up. Whether through gambling or lying or stealing, I would have screwed it up even sober. Because I have these defects that just don't go away. They're not one of those things you get sober and, oh, you stop stealing. Oh, Marty's never going to steal again. I'm 14 years sober. I walk into like Safeway. We have Smith's. I grab three avocados. I go to the self-service line and I punch in avocado and they say, how many do you have? My head said, two. (laughs) Red peppers are more expensive than green peppers. You ever push the wrong button? (laughs) It, It was an accident. Tuscan melons or cantaloupe, they're two totally different things, different prices, if you don't know that. You know, you can't scan the ground beef and put in the filet mignon in your bag. They don't like that. I struggle with the disease of alcoholism and defects of character. My first sponsor, George, he saved my life. And how he saved my life was he introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous. He introduced me to men who love AA. They don't like AA. They don't fool around with this thing. They love it. They go to book studies. They go to detoxes. They pick new guys up. You know, I'm eight, nine months sober. I got no shot to ever get a driver's license. I had a judge similar to Marchesi who said to me, Mr. Camerata, you will never, do you hear never, drive again. Don't even try to apply for a driver's license. So I'm like nine, ten months over, and Bob Darrell, who's my grand sponsor at the time, says, why don't you drive? I said, well, you should have seen the judge. The judge said, you're never, ever going to drive. He said, I don't care. You're going to pay him back anyway. I said, I don't do that. 
If I'm not getting a driver's license, you think I'm going to pay motor vehicle the fines I owe them? There's no way that's happening. You got the wrong guy. I'm not doing it. But what happened was I didn't want to stop being around these guys. It was the first time my life started feeling like something was happening. It was like I was 16 years old again. And I'll tell you, this happened. Bob did this for me. I was about a year sober. And uh, after a meeting, he put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, you know, you could be really good at this. You got potential. And it was like I was 16 all over again. Like maybe this time, maybe I found something that I could be useful in. I became a fanatic on the big book. I walked around with a big book in my back pocket when people shared. I looked in the book where it was, what page number, what paragraph. I shared at every meeting, even if they didn't want. Anybody want to share? Yeah, I do. I was a pain in the butt. But I love, I fell in love with AA. And I can tell you something, if you're early in sobriety and you don't fall in love with this thing, it's going to be hard. It's not easy to take this and say, oh, it's all right. It's going to be, you know, if you're alcoholic, it's not going to be okay. Anybody who tells you you're going to be all right is lying to you. This disease is progressive. It doesn't care that you want to stop. It doesn't care that you have children. It doesn't care that your mother's crying in the other room. It doesn't matter. Bob said to me, you're going to start sending some money to New Jersey. Again, I told him, I'm not going to do that, Bob. And then I decided I'll start sending $20. I sent 20 and I sent 30 and I said 20 And I sent about $600, and all of a sudden, I got a check for $2 saying I overpaid and that I was eligible for a driver's license. <laughs> I ran a motor vehicle. I hadn't looked at a test or a book in 20 years. I said, I'm going. I get to motor vehicle. I get in the room. You got to get a 40 out of 50 questions right to get a drive, to take the driving part of it. I had 10 wrong with 11 questions left. And I remember sitting saying, come on, God, make these questions easier. I mean, stop with the, you know, a moped questions and, you know, <laughs> the ins- how much insurance do you need to cover? How many feet? Uh, uh, come on, how about, what's a red light? <laughs> you know, give me, give me something easy. And I get the next one right and the next one right. And I'm down to like three and I'm like shaking. I get the next one right. I got two. Uh, come on, you can do this. Get the next one right. And I'm shaking. I get the next question right. And I start crying. There's these two 16-year-old kids next to me. (laughs) They're looking at me like, what is wrong with this guy? They got no idea that driver's license was worth. It was like, wow. Wow. And I knew it was Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew it was sponsorship. I knew it was this God I was praying to. I remember I was, I was early in sobriety. And I was on my knees praying. I was still living in a sober living house. And nobody's there. And I got on my knees. And it was like somebody had put a blanket around me. I remember how it felt. Like, it's never happened again. But I I promise you, I know exactly how it felt. And I remember saying to myself that day, you know what? I think you could stay sober. I fell in love with AA and I did everything they asked. Set up chairs. Take I'll take the garbage out in the bathroom for the rest of my life. I can never repay Alcoholics Anonymous. Never. I'm a low-bottom drunk that doesn't really have any, any shot of getting the life that I have today. I got that driver's license, and 
one of the guys who was friends, who was at the detox that day, Sheldon, he worked at a car dealership, and uh, I got my first car, Chevy Malibu, teal. And uh, he said to me, get a car with four doors. God likes a car with four doors. <laughs> he said it, I believed him. Got a car with four doors. He looked me in the eye and he said, Marty, I promise you, if you put new guys in your car, you'll never need gas money. And I started filling my, my car with guys every day. And uh, in the next seven or eight years, I put about 300,000 miles on two cars. And I picked up guys all day and all night, and I worked, and I fell in love. And, and Alcoholics Anonymous just wowed me. I uh, formed relationships with people. I made amends to people. I flew back to New Jersey. I knocked on doors that I was afraid to knock on. I went to cemeteries and got on my knees in, in front of my father's grave. And uh, Am I willing to go to any lengths to stay sober? It's, it's, are you willing to get on the airplane? Are you willing to write the letter? Are you willing to... Be the assistant to the supervisor of the chair guy. Yeah. You know, almost everybody who's been sober for a long time will say Alcoholics Anonymous saved their life. And they're not lying. If you're early in sobriety, and I say early instead of new because I wasn't new. I had been coming to Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time. And I had this problem with this I know button in my head where you would tell me to do something, and I would say, yeah, I know. Yeah, you should get a sponsor. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you should read the literature. You know, um, they wrote it for a reason. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you should take the steps. They'll help you. I know. I was in the car with a bunch of guys that we were going somewhere, and uh, I kept saying, I know, and the guy pulled over, and he said, if you say I know one more time, you're getting out of this car. I uh, I remember I was about a year and a half sober, and uh, I was sitting in my mother's house uh, across from my mother's husband, who, again, he didn't like me. And uh, he had that, you stole my coins look on his face. <laughs> I remember going to my sponsor and telling him, you know, he's got this look on his face, like, you know, I stole his coins look. And he said, well, have you paid him back? I said, well, no, but, you know, I've been doing the right thing. I go to meetings and all that. He said, well, maybe when you pay him back halfway, maybe that face will change. And I started making amends to people, and their faces changed. And uh, I don't know. I, uh, I got a million stories. Alcoholics Anonymous is full of stories. That's what makes AA so great. Is that we all have some story and we all have some hope. I was listening to the people reading early on and I thought about the first tradition when the gentleman was sharing and uh, the, talking about the traditions and, and the unity, how important Alcoholics Anonymous is. I mean, almost every one of us know that if we, we stop going to meetings, there's a high risk. The risk becomes... Everybody says... The book says resentment's the number one offender, but it doesn't say it's the number one offender and you'll drink. It's the number one offender that blocked you from the sunlight of the Spirit, and then you'll drink. I think the number one offender is absenteeism. If you ask most people, well, I stopped going to meetings, I don't call my sponsor anymore. My sponsor moved. You know, so well, I never got another sponsor. You don't know him, but he lives on the other side of town. Stuff like that. You know, uh, you start walking your way a little bit at a time away from Alcoholics Anonymous. The thing that saved your life. The thing that you owe. You start moving a little bit at a time. I say this. I, I think it's hard to stay hot for Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it's hard to stay, stay enthusiastic all the time in AA. But I can tell you something. When... 
I have never, in anything in my life, I have never had more purpose in my life than in Alcoholics Anonymous. I built, I built, God built, AA built, an amazing life for me. Me and my wife have been together for 14 years. It wasn't easy. We struggled. We had a lot. My wife's a worse alcoholic than I am. I'll tell you that. You don't want to see her drinking. She kicks you when she's drunk. You pick her up and then you put her down and then she kicks you. You know, uh, she's a great alcoholic, but she's even better sober. Uh, my wife helps women. Lately, God has been using me in uh, areas that I never thought He would. Um, I love being married. I love being responsible for my family. I got four. And I'm telling you, if they were here, you would say the same thing. I have four beautiful grandchildren that love me. They run to me, pop, pop. We go to Kinderland. They're, they're running around having so much fun. My mother lives across the driveway from me. We own a house across the street from my brother and my mother. It's Italian American. <laughs> yeah. We have great brunch on Sunday. If you're ever in Las Vegas, just knock on the door. Uh, I don't know. I, I could probably stand here and talk a lot longer. Uh, I can tell you if you're, if you're struggling with this thing, um, don't go away. Stay here. You know, people will, they'll treat you good here. Even when it's hard for people to treat you good, they'll treat you good here. You know, there's an old saying, we'll love you until you learn how to love yourself. And there's a lot of truth to that. Um, my first sponsor told me a story, and I'll, I'll close with this story. He said, Marty, there's a section in the book that talks about where, like, passengers of a great ship liner at sea that, you know. Uh, and uh, George told me, he said, Marty, we're, uh, we're on a raft boat, and we're going out there, and we're looking for people to help. And when we find somebody, we're going to wrap a blanket around them and give them a cup of coffee. And then we're going to go look for somebody else. And when we find somebody else, the guy who has the blanket gives the blanket to somebody else. And if you're not willing to do that here in Alcoholics Anonymous, then AA may not be for you. There's different ways to do service in here. I mean, there's, there's people doing all kinds, of, you know, I'm, I've had coffee commitments, chair commitments, setup commitments. Uh, you know, I cooked f uh, in f um, Founders Day. There's always something to do in AA. Um, don't let... I, I say this out loud so that I never forget. Don't let what AA gave you walk you away from it. Don't get too busy out there that Alcoholics Anonymous plays second or third or fourth fiddle. Uh, and it's not so much that you may wind up drinking again, but if you're not here, how can you help the new person? If we stop coming, the meetings will disappear. And our primary purpose is to stay sober and help another alcoholic. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I hope my feet show it on a daily basis. Um, you've given me a life I could never repay you for. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.